Anyhow, uh, <laughs> why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take off the hat. Yeah. All right. So we got so much more to discuss. So I guess the first thing we have to do is is where we started this conversation the other day was the challenges that are facing the air taxi slash flying car market in the not too distant future. And we said that a lot of them are basically waiting on the administrators or airspace FAA guidance on what it's going to take to take these things from either the manned position to the unmanned position and how they're going to design the airspace and the intricate parts that are necessary to get what they're going to call urban air mobility, which is basically just what it sounds like, which is urban air mobility. Um, and as that really stands, how does that really, I guess, translate to the average public? Because the, the average public really doesn't understand, I guess, what urban air mobility means. And it's just that. It means... How are you going to get from point A to point B in the air uh, using the technologies that they currently have yeah. in place yeah. and what's going to be part of that development? Yeah. In in a city setting, yeah. Right. So, obviously, yeah, I mean, uh, many people watching, of course, you guys have probably flown on planes, but uh, jets, you know, travel in through various uh, national airspace system, but uh, it's very well planned out and managed quite well now that they've been doing it a while, of course. Mm -hmm. and so there's airspace set up just for those corridors for those places that we go uh, now that we are uh, on the uh, evolving field of air taxis and as it would be drones unmanned or manned uh, vehicles but in you know in cities low level the the need to address that as far as regulatory and safety aspect is is here so this is what mike's talking about yeah so yeah so NASA basically in this article current uh, coming to you from the Vanderbilt School of Engineering says that NASA has got a $2.5 million project on their test bed right now, which is looking at the development of test testing the safety of these uh, these air taxis. Now, when we talk about safety, we talk about threat and error management. We don't want to talk over people's heads because there's a lot of discussion that has to happen about what we what really comes into the very minute points of safety. It, it comes down to very fine details. So we don't want to overbore you with that. But in a simplification manner, what ends up happening is anything that's basically flying has to be concerned about, well, its destination, uh, how long it's going to take to get there, and when it gets there, what environment it's going to find in that surroundings, right? Uh, how is the weather going to be? What obstacles are going to be? What's the wind conditions? Okay, what's the landing site going to look like? Those are all variables that need to be figured out. And in an urban env environment, when things are flying, it gets a lot more complicated because there's a lot more things technically to hit uh, and a lot more interference from other things. So when we have complicated electronics on board these aircraft, there's also going to be more cellular traffic. There's going to be probably more infrared from, sec from like security systems. Mm. Uh, there's probably going to be more Wi-Fi repeaters and, and all sorts of different things that are going to be included in that. And when one of these devices is flying, it's not as easy as just putting it up there because it's going to have to think on its own on what to avoid as far as obstacles, weather, and environment. And that presents a challenge because, as Corey can, can kind of tell you right now, the minute you have something airborne and it has to turn in a different direction and there might be other things flying around it, that creates a systemic problem where everybody else has to react to what it's doing, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's That's a handoff that he didn't expect. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> of course. But yes, as as Mike's saying, there the fact that these aircraft will be operating just again low level in a city. That's just an environment that aviation, like big commuter jets, have, it's not quite the same, right? They right. operate in class alpha airspace. Uh, that's where they usually cruise, and class alpha is quite high. Starts at like eighteen thousand feet above the surface uh, or well rather above sea level but there you go 18,000 feet uh, and so um, it's just a different place and they need to address that many as we talked about before on the channel too with with the technology really uh, coming along at a nice speed evolving and with many many different players and we you know we cover almost a new one almost weekly it almost we haven't talked about yet uh, there's a lot going on in there a lot of players with government entities NASA's involved and we'll get there's just a lot of things sorted out before uh, it really hits prime time. Um, and that's, that's just asset. So if this is going to actually work, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you got up there? You got the, one? well, I'm just playing yeah. up in the background. NASA yeah. is just showing some of the competitors that are in this marketplace. And look, the, oh, the Airbus, vehicle design yeah. is one thing, which is fantastic that these vehicles are being designed with the capabilities of transporting people short distances using either electricity or APUs or some sort of device. But this, vast infrastructure of all these moving parts, it's critical. 
Uh, it's critical for them to get it right. Uh, they can't really, they can't really just tinker with this. That the testing and the, the flow of how this is all going to work has to be in place because should there be any difficulties, these devices should they experience power failures or should they experience any sort of mishaps, bird strikes, so on and so forth, they're going to have to make the determination of when it's safe to continue when it's impractical to continue, and when it's going to be a desired aircraft state to be back on the ground as fast as possible. Now, each one of these devices with their multiple propellers or multiple propulsion devices are going to have different variable, I guess, situations and how far they can continue into undesired aircraft states, meaning a power plant failure, a complete power plant failure, which means it's an immediate landing. And it's going to have to diagnose how to assess and avoid those risks, right? So this is part of the air mobility package because all that's going to have to be baked into either the person flying it and their ability to interact with the technology that's on board the aircraft or the automated systems that are on board that are going to have to decide kind of on the go what's happened and how to react. And, and so Corey and I, when we taught a lot of people how to fly helicopters, we always had to speak in terms of, are we going to land immediately, land as soon as practical, or, you know, continue on and labor on with whatever's happening, knowing that it's a, a nuisance, but can we make it to our destination? And what would you say that the skills that are required that need to be, well, in, innate to the human being that you're training and to the systems that are gonna be on board that are gonna need to make those decisions? Yeah, so one thing we, we would uh, try to emphasize to people who are to fly when encountering an undesired aircraft state, and I, we'll just talk in plain terms, I won't use all the terms setting the but if you can imagine for a second you were in the aircraft with one of us and we're flying along, give you a practice and malfunctioning. Uh, we would initially give that to you, maybe verbally or something like that. So the part of that, and then you'd have to think about like what what does that mean to me? What kind of impact does it have on the flight? And then you need to act you know, or react to that. But I, I don't want to discount the very beginning of that, and that was the detect. You have to detect the problem to begin with. So one of the thing, if you're a person on board, you have to not only see all the gauges and maybe even listen to the noises that are normal and all that, but you have to detect anything that's abnormal, whether it's a gauge uh, or a warning light or a caution light or some noise. I mean, there's, there's quite a large number of things that could kind of clue you into something that's not quite right. Mm -hmm. And that certainly goes along with things that want to be flying automated, right? If you're talking about a system that be flying itself around and you're going to have to program in uh, it, some logic, whether it's neural net or on board or it's across to someone else, we'll get to that. It has to detect all the, have, be able to detect all the things that could. Be. So um, that's one of the first things to you got to detect that. But then also you have mm -hmm. to be able to interpret that accurately. Know so actually what you're looking for. And that goes a bit into just knowledge. And of course, a lot of the engineers you see our videos playing. This is, I think, the NASA still. So mm -hmm. it's quite a lot of knowledge you can, that they're going in there. But it's, it's something to know that. Uh, when you teach a human to obviously detect and interpret and then figure out what maybe the uh, scenarios they can go with and then choose one and then act on that. That's a, that's a chain of events that uh, now we're trying to get to do the same thing. And there's a lot of hurdles that can be, <laughs> that can arise there that may not seem, <laughs> there's a big um, one too. that may not seem uh, apparent in the beginning. So yeah. it's as they do a lot of the testing to see how we can get automation it they have to they have to meld not only the technology and the the logic of what, what you want to do with that technology but decision making well or it's even it's even yeah because you know it's great when everything works but you have to also design the system for when it's at failure right yeah, yeah. so when yeah. the system's at failure it's going to have to go into some sort of mode like maybe a limp mode where basically it's going to decide hey i can't make it to my destination now so i only have maybe seven minutes of, of opportunity to find a safe landing spot, right? And look, unfortunately, aviation's riddled with bad decision-making by pilots, okay, that yeah. have continued on and stressed themselves into situations where uh, it unfortunately didn't pan out. And that's a long chain of events that took place because it generally didn't start with that one decision to continue. It generally started with maybe poor planning or someplace else down the line. So these devices are going to have to be critical in thinking that before they even leave the surface, they're going to have to have a plan for action. And like Corey said, when we're actually teaching people things that are in the actual aircraft, we're looking for their decision-making ability. But a lot of times that decision-making ability starts even before you got yourself into that environment. 
So some of these systems are going to be so elaborate that these devices, before they take off, are going to probably have to making callouts to other weather stations, making callouts to the surrounding area to find out what other traffic is in the in the environment. It's going to find or have to discover new pathways to communicate when it's actually discovered itself in a position where it's about to fail, has failed, or what its next action is going to be to recover from the failure. And as you stack more of these urban air mobility transports around, they're all going to have to re react in some sort of neural net technology where this one has experienced a failure, but there's seven or eight of them behind it. Now, what are they going to do if this thing has to, I'd say, turn back into the wind? And that's because it needs to be wind facing or, yeah, you know, there's power lines and it, and it can't maintain the same altitude that it could earlier. So now it has to turn in a different direction. You could even say, I was also, it goes right along with what Mike's saying. If we, if we were to say that, Along the pathway of this the flight, there's like designated landing areas mm -hmm. that things can go if something goes not great with the public that there's designated landing areas in case something goes wrong. Right. But nevertheless, where I'm going with this is if one of the one of the um, aircraft that's airborne decides it needs to land and it takes that spot. OK, good. Now they've landed. Everything's good. They're, they're safe. Great. But now that means if somebody else in the other aircraft has a problem, that landing spot's not. Nope. So. um. And on some level, what I think Mike's going to is they're going to, have to be able to communicate with each other. Yes. Whether that's through a ground based station or uh, the vehicles to them within themselves or both. Um, and sure. one of the people, one of the manufacturers will we'll get to. Later. So anyhow, in the development of all this, so this is this is just a description of what the entire system has to do. And for in, in order for you to, to successfully place uh, more people in the flying general public in these urban, you know, air taxi environments, right? So what does that look like? It looks like you trying to merge onto a very busy highway, okay? In your car, there's lots of traffic. You're pushing forward to get in line with that traffic, and everyone else around you has to react. And suddenly, in the middle of the road, you blow your tire. That's the best analogy I can give you is to that. This system has to have that amount of fluidity in it to take on not only the expected, the unexpected, but the flow of traffic, right? So with that... There's also NASA's research. You can actually find these links in the description below. NASA.gov has this, which is their Advanced Air Mobility National Campaign, which is also working with their AAM <clears throat> ecosystem and working groups, okay? And they all have these collaborative enterprises that are looking at how to integrate all these pieces, okay? And it's fantastic. You guys can go in there and click on all this because this is what's going to really develop the top-down look at how the future is going to handle Air taxis and air and flying cars. Yeah. They're literally having to build this infrastructure now so it's in place for the new developments when they happen in technology to push forward. But they're not the only ones playing in this field because as well as just, you know, NASA, developers and, of, of course, like Jobby and everybody else, they have to figure out whether they're going to turn around and build their own onboard systems that are going to handle this yeah. or if they're going to outsource that flying technology to other companies. And like Corey and I have realized, others are really stepping up like, and Corey can go ahead and talk about Honeywell here for a minute because they're also doing their job to shape the future by building these systems for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if you're... Uh, so just move along to the next one. It's actually the Honeywell's website, and it's aerospace. Or aerospace.honeywell.com. So it's their aerospace Honeywell. And Honeywell does a bunch of things, but one thing they, they do do, which if you're a pilot or, or know they make avionics, you've flown something, you might have Honeywell equipment somewhere on the aircraft... They do a bunch of different stuff, but focusing on this here, uh, they've already made some partnerships. Uh, Honeywell itself has already made some partnerships with some companies we've already mentioned on the channel. Vertical Aerospace is down here. Pipstrel is down here. Faraday or Farad Faraday. Faraday. Um, <laughs> I don't know how exactly how you say it. Faraday. Faraday. Maybe. I think. Uh, and then uh, the one we talked about yesterday, actually, Aviation is in here as well. So um, they they've already making some partnerships to get the. It's probably a good business case for them too to be on the. Uh, forefront of uh, market no no there but mm -hmm. but it uh but it's it's kind of going to show that some of the bigger players in just the tech field other than the manufacturers themselves of making the vehicles are really trying to step forward and uh, come up with some some solutions for other uh, safety or um technical inspections um other things so yeah yeah so it looks like in part of their technologies and some of the things that they're looking at they're looking at the passenger urban air mobility aircraft, and that's going to be actually the aircraft that you physically fly on. Vehicle management, meaning how, <laughs> how is that vehicle going to manage itself? Fly-by-wire, which, which would indicate that if you Best actually surprise. have 
a person on board flying it that there has to be some sort of linkage between them and the aircraft. Now, normally, in most aircraft that are out there today, there's push rods, hydraulics. There's usually a lot of equipment on board yep, that yep. physically links the controls. Airbus is notably one of the aircraft that's flying almost completely fly-by-wire. And where there's no physical link, it's literally you have a joystick and that actually simulates what you feel with the aircraft yep. and then senses or sends all that transmitted data to the proper surfaces and moves them accordingly so the aircraft flies as it should when you move the stick. There's also detect and avoid, meaning that this thing has to have some sort of way, like using the LiDAR, using vision, using some sort of system where it can actually look forward and understand what's happening. Also detects future failures, like a, a battery pack failure or an engine failure, something of that nature. Actuation, which I'm going to assume is actually moving the surfaces themselves. Yeah, and then cool. show all, I'm not really sure about. But then also, they're very heavy into the propulsion, which is motor controllers, turbo generators, thermal management, Oh, actually, I guess it's show all for their actual. Yeah, it's just a, it's an interactive. <laughs> it's an interactive part. part. So, yeah, I'm not sure what show. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I wasn't gonna bring it up. But yeah, there you go ahead. Just, yeah. You get me on it, yeah. right? <laughs> it's and just, then, yeah. um, so that would also fall into people like Jet Up Terra, who has also announced that they have agreements with Honeywell, okay, for part of their propulsive unit. So there's that one. I didn't know that one was interactive because I actually I only yeah, read it in my yeah yeah there the buttons are. You can actually if you click if you go back to it you can cargo. Oh really? Let's wait, 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 let's go ahead. Right and... there says passenger urban. So says... Yeah, that one is also. Ah, okay, so there's cargo. And then I mean, I... yeah, obviously mm -hmm. they carry cargo, which we know, but then obviously go. they're a taxi sector. So for autonomy, fly-by-wire, so yeah, so there's basically detect and avoid, so yeah. there's their systems that are on board, their connectivity, which is going to be, you know, GPS, yep, some sort satellite. of Wi-Fi signals, sat nav, things mm -hmm. of that nature, right? Yep. Uh, all that's going to be in there. But then they have, in, and down here, and look, they have their avionics for urban air mobility. So they have the different parts of the systems that they're going to have. Um, and they just show you different examples. So look, it's just a continuation of the conversation because it's not going to be that easy to make this jump. And why we said the other day in one of our videos, you know, that this market really needs 10 years to mature because right now, even the experts are saying we're probably 10 years off from it actually maturing. So while Archer and Jobby and Lilium and all these guys are excited to bring their aircraft to market, um, if there's players that you see in the field that don't seem far as advanced, don't discount them at all because there's lots of opportunity. And I guess, I guess for us, the, the opportunity is how long do you wait and see for the market to really become saturated with so many players where they, they just say, okay, enough is enough, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be, there's a few more facets to I will get along with this. Like we're going to talk about e-hang in a minute. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was going to mention, which I can just quickly put in here and on too, but was that, uh, for example, like e-hang has an advantage there in China that they have a partnership with. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so they have a bit of an easier way in for do some testing and right. maybe getting some certifications for um, locations of where to do things. So it's a, there's a lot of facets to who will have success here and who will not and it might not it, it might not even be the that it could be right business cases it could be funding right, right there's a right. lot of SPACs going around we've talked about that a lot of people getting money from SPACs. um so there's just there's just a whole bunch of different ways that this could not work um and so the leaders in it now doesn't mean they're going to be leading in it right? no so, that's true that's true yeah and, and this, I guess this goes without saying, look, you know, in, in this country, the way we partner up with the government is a little bit different because a lot of companies go the other route. And what, what it means to be maybe in bed with the government means that you have a military contract or something of that yeah, nature, yeah. right? So, look, we, we know that other companies like Beta, we know they're, they're, they're actually developing those unmanned um, units in, in coercion with... I forget which. Is it Volocopter doing Volocopter might be uh, doing it, Air Force. and we and we know that Jet Up Terra obviously they publicly stated that they're doing their testing in the anechoic chambers to see that yep. they're viable yep. in whatever the military's plans are for for that. So that's another way for people to move in from the marketplace, which is make the old switch like helicopters did from the Vietnam sure. era, which was part in the military, yeah, military first, and know. then go to the you know go to the general public. So there's lots of ways to look at a way to to get into the marketplace, but if the infrastructure is sound. You have NASA, the FAA, and they finally put their workforce together. Yep. And you have the companies out there supporting that infrastructure. We hope, I guess I say we, we hope. Yeah, we hope too. We'll, we'll see these things flying within the next, I think, five to 10 years 
in a capacity where they're actually doing volume and they're actually turning a profit maybe 10 years from now. That's yep. what I think. Yeah, I'm thinking as well, like Mike said, I think we'll see them and I'll see we'll see some some form of it in five years. And yeah. what I'm going with that is like maybe if you're in Georgia, let's pull something. Up. You might have a urban air mobility air taxi service in Atlanta or something, mm -hmm. right? That's intercity. Or yeah, something. yeah, that would make sense. It wouldn't be everywhere yet. So I'm, yeah, I'm thinking, thinking five years to see something in place that's doing some business, and then ten years if it's, if it's something that's gonna be something that is proven to be profitable, right? Because money drives almost. Right. Then within ten years, you'd see it more widespread, of course. Sure. Yeah. I mean. And hey, remember, folks, thanks thanks to the 250 subscribers. And just want to say this as a caveat at the end. We are paying attention to this market specifically for three reasons. Number one, the investment dollars that are going into this market right now is enormous. It's exploding. And it's exploding up through multiple players. Okay, uh, It's not just one, two, you know, yes, we've started discussions with Terra, all this other stuff, but there's billions and billions of dollars at stake at this marketplace. It deserves the attention of some serious uh, introspection from not only the people that, that are going to provide the services for the pilots, but for the manufacturers, for the equipment manufacturers. It's a massive marketplace. Supply chain, everybody makes yeah. power plants, avionics, yeah. batteries, okay. all that's forward to this. Yeah. Yeah. Number number two, it is the probably at the forefront of the use of multiple technologies that people are finding on their everyday usage charts, like cellular technology, GPS technology, LIDAR, which is making its way into vehicles, as we've discussed recently, yep, yep. Uh, visual camera systems that Corey has in his Tesla. Yep. So this is going to be a complete integration of all these systems in probably some of the most fascinating technology combinations that we've seen since probably going to the moon. So well, yeah, us being techies and pilots, kind of like, kind of interesting. Yeah, <laughs> <Kinda> so it <laughs> sum it up. It kind of sum it up. It <laughs> so it's kind of and and the third thing is there's money to be made. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, th there's no there's no there's no hiding in the fact that if we could become part of that conversation as a whole, that that's something that would be tempting towards us because that's something that that we would just normally talk about anyhow. Yeah, that like we said on the channel. Right, I'm petting the dog if we can. Mm -hmm. here um but uh but like we said many times on this channel, we, we we talked about things before we even had a youtube channel we talked about stuff yeah. like this cars technology uh aviation and this was a little this is honestly it was before air taxes were even a thing yeah yeah in its current form because we could see them coming yeah we, 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 were, we, saw we coming. talked about it and we're like okay you know but it's, and, and now that we got a channel we're talking about this up with you guys because we're happy we're happy to still talk about it and it's cool that you guys are interested yeah and and so I, I guess it's interesting when you're sitting in the controls of a helicopter and you know at some point that even this technology has to advance because, look, the form and the yes. shape of a helicopter hasn't so changed it. in a long time, right? And we were always sitting there going, look, some of these airframes we were flying are almost decades old yeah. and 40 and 50 years yeah, old. Very cool to fly helicopters, but when you realize some of the ones we were designed, maybe not yeah. that particular airframe, but literally designed in the 50s, you're going, yes. this is cool, and... The things you can do with it have great utility, but I'm I'm really curious where the next step in technology goes. Sure. Like what? Yeah, go ahead. There's got to be something the newer. Thought. Yeah, there's got to be something newer than this, <laughs> right? That that we can do. So when is that gonna happen? And, and it just we might be on on the verge of of changes here. But no, no evolutions versus revolutions. Mm -hmm. We'll see how this really plays out. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, but we're we're super excited anyway. And the last part was drones. When I when I started flying mm -hmm. helicopters, you know, if you wanted to put together a drone, you had to literally go to a hobby store, yep. build a frame, yep. get four motors, yep. find a speed controller, battery packs, yep. put them together. Four years later, DJI and and other manufacturers changed that entire game, and today they're almost looked as as recreational toys. Uh, we do have more stuff coming out on drones that we're going to talk about later on next week, which is about all this trust information and, and what size and the legalities, because, hey, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble re real easy. Yeah. But um, so that's kind of also a lead into the next subject, which Corey is going to hit it off right here about uh, we someone.